Professor Olson, good morning. Welcome to our podcast. How is Saturday morning treating you there? Good morning. Greetings from the United States, from Texas specifically. Uh, we're having a very nice morning here in Texas. Um, is it warm? Is it hot? Because the last couple of days here in Sarajevo, in the capital city of our country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, have been like, it's been truly too hot. <laughs> Yes, it's very warm here, too, in Texas. Our summers are traditionally hot. Uh, it's in the 90s, and it's been that way for the last several weeks. Yeah, except I, as I believe, as I can actually remember, like earlier this year, the winter was unusually cold, right? We had a terrible episode here in uh, Texas where we had below freezing temperatures, uh, caused a lot of problems with electricity, with water. People really suffered. We had several days of uh, really difficult conditions. Yeah, basically something that was totally unusual for the region. Um, I just want to say when we like, as we are touching upon the word of unusual, um, you have had an unusual and an unusually interesting career and are having a yet another really, really interesting career right now. And I would like us to start from the present moment, actually. Because as I was doing my research, as I was reading about you, the first thing that was like that truly caught my attention was the name of your academic title. And that is the professor of practice. And because English isn't my first language, you know, I was thinking, okay, so this might be the first time that I'm reading about this sort of a title. It might be something that's usual, you know, in the United States or in the West or whatever. But as time progressed, as I, said, I did more research, I found out that this was a title that was kind of specific to you. So Professor Olson, may you like perhaps in brief terms, explain to us what are you actually a, pro a professor of practice of? A professor of practice is a title that we give to non-academics by profession, people who are practitioners as we call them, a lot of universities are bringing people in from various backgrounds who do not have PhDs, but who have real world experience that will be of value in the educational process. And the Bush School of Government Public Service of Texas a University decided from the beginning that it wanted to have a blended faculty. It wanted to have world-class academics, and of course they are essential, but also to have people who come from the world of diplomacy or national security, intelligence, counterterrorism, because that's an area where many of our graduates want to go into. And we thought that having people here who have actually done that kind of work would be beneficial for them. I think it's a good formula. It's worked very well for us. And so I am not a PhD but I am a professor of the practice. And that means that I am bringing real world experience into the classroom. And you're bringing, a, how would I say, a real world experience of counterintelligence. But before we dwell into the topic itself, before we dwell into the career of intelligence and counterintelligence and the specifics of counterintelligence per se, um, may, I, may I ask you like, what were your initial reactions to I assume being called upon to be a professor um, at the Bush School of Government. I was very excited about the opportunity to come to the Bush School at the Texas A&M because I'd always had this thought while I was on active duty in the CIA that one day I might like to teach. I might like to share my experiences with the next generation. And it has been indescribably rewarding to have this second career, to work with young men and women and to help them realize their dreams of serving our country in the intelligence community. And we have in fact been following the desires of our former president Bush, the founder of our school, who was a strong advocate of the intelligence community. As you know, I'm sure he was at one point director of the CIA. He also was very close to the intelligence community when he was vice president and president. So he very much wanted us to carry out that role. And uh, for me, it has been a dream come true to be able to work with these uh, young people here and then to send them into important and exciting careers in the United States intelligence community. 
What do you think from your own observations in terms to, of communicating with these students, with young males, young females, young men and young women, what do you think they appreciate the most in regards to your own experience? What do they like to, you know, study and listen most about? I think the students really appreciate the opportunity to work with people who have been in the careers that they want to have. So those of us who have been there, and I'm not alone, we have other practitioners here at the Bush School, other people from the FBI, from the military, from NSA and elsewhere, who are sharing with the students their practical experience, kind of a hands-on professional focus to the educational process. Students, I think, appreciate that. I think a lot of students come to the Bush School specifically because they want to have that rather professional preparation rather than just purely an academic preparation. <clears throat> so yeah, in our classes, we take them into actual operations. We take them on the street. We prepare them for the, the kinds of challenges they're gonna face on the job. Uh, they like it and the prospective employers like the fact that our students are good to go when they get there because they've already done it. Um, so they have, really, really extremely good preparation. Did you have any sort of preparation? Um, or actually, let me rephrase this. How did it come about for you to start your career in the CIA? What did you do beforehand? And was it something that you were aiming for? Or did it come about unexpectedly? It was very unexpectedly. In fact, <laughs> it was a fluke. Uh, I came from a small town in Iowa. I never would have dreamed that this was a possibility. I barely knew what the CIA was. I had kind of this feeling that I, I would like to serve our country in some capacity someday. So after I graduated from university, I went into the United States Navy. I served aboard guided missile destroyers and frigates as an officer for four years. I found that very fulfilling, but I didn't know what the next step would be. When I left the Navy, I went to law school back in my home state. I was gonna be a small town lawyer. I was gonna work in a county seat town in Iowa, serve my community. I think it would have been kind of a, a nice lifestyle, but that was not to be. And fate intervened because I was in my last year of law school, heading toward a town in Iowa when I received a phone call out of the blue. Mr. Olson, <laughs> we think we have a career opportunity that might be of interest to you. And that was a CIA calling. They found me out there. I didn't uh, seek them out. I barely knew what the CIA was. And so they started a lengthy process uh, that eventually resulted in an offer to join what we call the clandestine service, the Directorate of Operations, the undercover espionage and covert action arm of the CIA. And it didn't take me long to realize how much I loved that kind of work, how rewarding it was for me to be uh, serving our country overseas as an intelligence officer. So I ended up uh, spending 31 years uh, undercover in the CIA, mostly overseas. And the real bonus for me was that I met my wife, Mary. <laughs> because she was also working there. So we were in effect a husband and wife undercover CIA team. Um, we can touch upon that if you would like a, bit, a little bit later on, but I would just like us to trace back, you know, to that phone call. Um, my assumption is, you know, they somehow figured out that you were right, like a right candidate due to some reasons. Um, do you know what those reasons were, how they found out about you? Were you ever told like how it came to be? Well, the CIA has spotters all around the country, particularly on college campuses. And I don't know who my spotter was. We never reveal their identity, but I have some suspects, <laughs> faculty of the College of Law, University of Iowa. Somebody spotted me. Somebody saw something in me that made them think that I'd be a good candidate for the CIA. So that name was passed to the CIA. What I think they saw in me was probably the fact that I had served in the military. That's not a prerequisite, but it's a plus when we find someone with military experience. 
I had spent a lot of time overseas. I already spoke pretty good uh, French and Russian. I think that was a plus. I was in graduate school. I was in law school making good grades. So for whatever reason, the spotter thought that I was a good fit for the CIA. Whoever it was, I say thank you, because I never would have thought of this career on my own. And it turned out to be uh, a wonderful career. So, so what I'm basically getting um, from your answer, like one of the, not, maybe not one, but some of the things that, um, how would I say, you know, for the lack of better terms in my, in my English, um, the recruiters or the spotters, as you would say, and the people who are actually the employers, um, the, the, the qualities that you're looking in, in the potential candidates and the candidates themselves might be so, let's say, like knowledge that would come in handy, so, so to speak, like potential knowledge of different languages, um, being able to fulfill tasks successfully, um, you know, due to your college, um, university success and your previous um, engagement within the military, within the Navy itself, and the third thing, what I would say is basically, you know, having the discipline maybe to carry out the task once it's, you know, laid out in front. But, you know, within your 31 years of both serving, I believe you had like four foreign missions. Um, you were also a chief of, uh, a chief of CIA counterintelligence. Um, through all of those experiences, which other qualities are the ones that are looked for in potential CIA covert intelligence um, operatives? I think probably the number one quality that we're looking for in applicants is character. <clears throat> we're looking for people that we can trust, people who are reliable, because we're going to share with them some very sensitive secrets We're going to make certain that they are in safe hands. We're also going to train them in some skills that could be badly misused, abused even, in the wrong hands. So we're very, very careful that we are recruiting people who are trustworthy. Mm. That's maybe a contradiction in the minds of many people because our whole profession is based on lying and cheating, manipulating and stealing the things that we do in espionage. And we need to have people who can do that, but we also want to know that people dealing with us are people that we can totally count on. And that's not everybody. A lot of people have character flaws that make them uh, poor candidates for our kind of work. We also, of course, put a lot of premium on the things that you mentioned, those uh, personal qualities, the intellect, the drive. And then, of course, maybe above all, in addition to character, we want people who truly feel a call to serve, people who are not all about themselves. I tell young people that if your primary motivation in life is money and power and prestige and status, good luck somewhere else, because that's not us. We are public service. We serve the American people. And you're not going to get rich in government, but the psychic rewards are beyond words to describe. Uh, it's a very, very fulfilling kind of thing to know that you are dedicating your life to something you believe in, something where you're making a difference. If you don't feel that, you're not our kind of person. And fortunately, there are a lot of young people out there who really have that desire to make a difference, to serve something they believe in, something larger than themselves. And those are the people we're looking for. Yeah, but I think it's also in that, uh, that aspect that you've been talking about right now, that the purpose itself of serving something above yourself, that is the community, the wider community and the country itself needs to be more important than money because if you're only look, not only, but if your primary motivation is money and power and dominance, in one way, shape, or form, that also makes you malleable to manipulation and to something that we could, you know, you know, dwell a little bit further later on to people actually, you know, how would I say, going to the other side. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. And unfortunately, our selection process is not perfect. Some people get in who should not have gotten in. 
There are people who have uh, psychological flaws. There are people who are very venal, who in fact are susceptible to financial incentives. And the people who have betrayed us, and unfortunately there have been many, several that I worked with, people I considered colleagues and friends, sold us out to the Russians. And in every case, it has been for money, sometimes a lot of money. And that has been uh, devastating for us. But there are, unfortunately, Americans who it turned out could be bought. Uh, Rick Ames is a good example. I don't know how much for sure how much Rick Ames was paid by the Russians for betraying us from inside the CIA, probably in excess of $3 million. Oof. I think that's despicable. Because mm -hmm. in the process of working with the Russians, he revealed the identities of many courageous Russians who were working secretly for the CIA. And of course, their fate was sealed when he gave them the identities, in most cases, execution. Did you have those fears exactly once you were um, in, I believe this is the right pronunciation, clandestine? operations yourselves. Were you afraid of your cover being blown? And if so, how did you cope with that? Well, cover is very important. We are very serious about uh, protecting our cover. Uh, our work is not risk-free. There is some danger. And the best protection you have is a good cover. So we take that very seriously. I had various covers during my career. You live that life. To the outside world, you are what your cover is. I kind of compare being undercover to being a good actor or an actress. Because as you know, the best actors and actresses get so into their roles that that's who they become. We become our covers. So no matter what my cover was, I lived that life. Even my own children thought that that's who I was. My parents thought that who I, that's who I was. So the fact that I had a double life, that I was also a spy, uh, never was known to anybody else. And so you are very scrupulous about making certain that you don't do anything. Over the course of your career, as you become more senior, as you become exposed to friendly liaison services, and as you get involved in some oper operational activity, which is suspect, your cover erodes a little bit. And by the time you become a senior manager at the CIA, as I did become, your cover is pretty much gone because you are known to several different foreign intelligence services, ones that you cooperated openly with, mm -hmm. some of which had leaks in them, and so it goes to other services as well. That's kind of an inevitable part of the job. But the really important on the street clandestine work, we rely on our younger officers to a large extent, whose cover is still very, very tight. And they need that cover to be able to carry out their work safely. I mean, I can only imagine the psychological pressure in terms of having a cover, for example, in front of the parents, in front of friends and both the old friends and the newly acquainted ones. Um, could you share, if that's all right with you, um, with us, you know, how, how did it come about and what was the process like of, for example, parents and friends finding out what you were truly involved with? And, you know, how did they find out? Did you tell them that or how did it happen? For 31 years, no one knew that uh, Meredith and I were in the CIA. Coming out from undercover, as I was required to do to join a university, because by regulation, we cannot be on college campuses covertly. And also, since I'm going to be teaching intelligence, I have to <laughs> reveal the fact. I have some expertise in that area. It's 31 years of work in uh, intelligence in my case. Coming out from undercover was traumatic. In fact, Meredith and I had originally thought that we would never come out from undercover, as many of our colleagues do. You go through this career undercover, you retire undercover, and you never reveal to anyone that you had this intelligence past. That's comfortable, that's a nice way to ease into civilian life. 
but we had to come out and we knew what the consequences would be of doing that. We were willing to do that because it was such an honor, frankly, to have been invited by former President Bush, the father, to join the new school that he was creating of government, the Bush School of Texas A&M. We were willing to accept those consequences. When you come out from undercover, in effect, you are announcing to the whole world, hey, when we were in your country, yeah. guess what we were doing? <laughs> we were violating your laws. We were committing espionage. And so that means that your future overseas travel is going to be limited. That's okay because Meredith and I have already seen the world and there are wonderful things to see and do in the United States. That wasn't too much of a sacrifice. The second consequence is, of course, uh, your personal safety because when you come out from a recover, I don't want to over-dramatize this, but potentially be, you could become a target for people that hate the CIA and want to strike back. And so you have to be careful. You have to take your precautions, which we do. It's just a, a way of life. And then the third consequence is telling your family, telling your friends. And that was a real concern for Meredith and me. When we had to come out from undercover, how will our parents react? Will they be hurt that we lied to them for all those years? That was uncomfortable for us. And it's kind of interesting because both sets of parents, Meredith and mine, independently, when we told them that we'd been in the CI all those years, reacted in exactly the same way. You know what that was? We Thank did. you for not telling us sooner. <laughs> <laughs> they said, when you were in all those foreign countries, we would want to not want to have known that you were in the CI and have to worry about what it was that you were actually doing. That's why we chose not to tell them. And I think in our case, that was the right decision. Now, our children were different because when Meredith and I were serving in Vienna, which is, of course, one of the real hot spots of espionage, always has been and still is, we received a death threat from some terrorists, a letter to me which uh, said that I personally by name, Meredith personally by name, and each of our three children personally by name were going to be killed. And that was disturbing. It was serious. It was not a, a prank. It was a serious death threat. And the CIA actually offered to pull us out of Vienna, particularly because of the death threat to the children. It was really my wife who said no. She said, we've been sent here with a mission to perform. We're not going to be chased away by an ugly letter from some terrorists. So we took a lot of precautions, particularly to protect the children, and that was when we decided we had to tell our oldest, Jeremy, who was 16 at the time, that we were in the CIA. So we took him aside. We sat him down in an acoustically secure room. We said, listen, Jeremy, mom and dad are in the CIA. We are a CIA family. There has been a death threat against our family, and we need your help. That's kind of a lot to put on a 16-year-old. said, you need to watch out for your little brother and sister. Make certain you always have them in sight that you're together. You alert to your surroundings. If you see anything that's suspicious, anybody's watching or following you, you have to get in touch with someone in a position of authority right away. Jeremy reacted with pride, as we'd hoped he would, and he did a good job of watching out for his brother and sister. And with his help and also a lot of other precautions we put on the children that they weren't aware of, we were able to stay and finish our assignment in Vienna. That's when we told Jeremy. And then when they were a little bit older, we were able to tell our other two children, Joshua and Hillary, the truth. And they, they reacted the same way with pride in their parents, which is what we'd hoped. I mean, I, I can only imagine how it might have, must have been for Jeremy, you know, when he was talking to his friends, you know, what do your parents do? You know, he would have to say whatever your cover was, whereas in his mind, he was just laughing like, oh, my parents have better jobs than yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. In fact, a lot of us say that when, if we do tell our children the truth, probably the most common first reaction of our children is disbelief that their parents could actually be doing any, anything that cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a good reaction to say the least. Yeah, that's right. uh, you mentioned Vienna was always a hotspot for espionage. What's, what's the reason for that? I'm, I'm asking basically because Vienna is you know, relatively close by to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yes, it is. Right. Well, Vienna was a 
real playground, so to speak, of espionage during the Cold War because of its geographic location. It's kind of on the edge of East and West. Also, it was neutral. And so it was uh, not aligned officially with either side during the Cold War. You could come and go to Vienna and you did not get much interference from the Austrians. As long as you didn't embarrass the Austrian government too much, they were pretty open to knowing that every intelligence service in the world was active in Vienna. Uh, The CIA and the KGB, for example, were nose to nose in Vienna. It was a real battleground. I loved it. It was a great place to operate. Uh, Every intelligence service in the world figured out that Vienna was a very nice place to conduct espionage. And so that's uh, why uh, we all operated there. Uh, The other major venue for Cold War espionage was Berlin. So Berlin and Vienna were really the the central locations. Now, espionage is worldwide, but it uh, really had a a great presence in in Vienna and in uh, Berlin. And of course, Eastern Europe, the Balkans are very close to Vienna. And a lot of people from the Balkans had reason to go to Vienna, to go through Vienna. And so we had an opportunity to meet people from all different nationalities, uh, lots of targets there. A lot of volunteers came to us in Vienna because it was accessible to them. So we were kind of the walk-in capital of the world where people from several different countries, including from Eastern Europe, would knock on our door and say, let's make a deal. Let's talk. <laughs> I mean, you lived through so much within your clandestine or clandestine. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation from time to time. So pardon me for that. Um, you know, within those 31 years, you know, in, you know, objective, like in total speaking in total, um, what were the most, you know, I mean, this is a broad question and I understand that, but what were the biggest changes in the world of espionage from when you first started working until your end of co- covered work? Well, I think the biggest difference was uh, technology. Technology evolved rapidly during the course of my career. We continued to rely on the, the staples, things like dead drops and brush passes and car tosses and walking meetings and car pickups. Those techniques are still in play, but technology has enabled us to do things that we'd only dreamed of before. So I saw a tremendous increase in our technological capabilities. In fact, and this sounds very immodest on my part, but I think that the reason that the CIA and United States intelligence community in general have been so successful over the years was because of our technological dominance, our technological superiority. Other countries and many of them have very qualified intelligence officers, uh, case officers we call them, they know their craft, they're very good at the recruitment cycle, they know how to recruit people. But what really gave us the decisive edge, I believe, in the Cold War and even since the Cold War is what we can do technologically. The kinds of things that we can see from the sky, the kinds of things that we can intercept and decrypt, the kind of spy gear that we issue our officers, really put us in a class by ourselves. Uh, Other services are good, but I think that we have prevailed uh, in large part because of the success of marrying the high-tech sector of the United States uh, corporate community with the intelligence community. That was one of the most beautiful things that I saw in my career, that really close relationship that we had with uh, corporate America, the high tech companies that were at the cutting edge of many different technological areas that then became tools for us in in the spy business. Some mind boggling things, a lot of things, of course, we can't even begin to talk about because they're still highly classified, but let your imagination work about what you think the 
intelligence community can do technologically, and you'll fall short of the short of the mark because we're actually better than that. Better than that, you know, the the first association that came to my mind once I was reading and listening to your conversations exactly about technology is, you know, we had a war here like. I don't know what, 20 something years ago. And it was, you know, for lack of better words, a classic war fought with, you know, guns, you know, through, you know, it would be a version of a World War II in the 1990s. Right. As you know, I was talking with my dad about this and he was like, you know, the way that the war was fought then and in the Second World War, when once you look at the West, is basically gone, not because, of course, only because of the nuclear threats and cyber technology, but because of technology in global, because why would there be a need, you know, speaking in layman's terms, to be in two different, what's the word in English, you know, in two different fields at war, shooting at each other, if you can, like, locate a person directly from the sky and, you know, target in within an inch, what you want to target and get it done with. Do you think that the world of espionage was changed in a similar way that the world of war was changed in terms of this technology? Because what I get is you're going to need men on the field in the war, but in way lesser numbers in the most amount of cases precisely because of technology. So does the... I believe that the operations such as, you know, the field operations such as the dead drop, you know, the brush passes and so on and so forth aren't obsolete, but their significance has dropped dramatically. I think that's valid. Uh, I will say, though, that the need for the traditional military strength will never go away. We always need to have that. I do believe you're right, though, that espionage and warfare will be increasingly impersonal. And I think that cyber is the next real battleground. I think when countries go to war in the future, God forbid that they will be attacking each other through their their cyber capabilities. It's already happening. The world of cyber is frightening. Uh, What countries can do to the other to cause harm. We've seen in the United States uh, in several examples recently about how harmful it can be. We know, for example, that the Chinese have implanted malware in the electrical grid in the United States. They have been inside the internet and they can cause tremendous disruptions at a time of their choosing in the future if we do not have better cyber defenses. I tell my students in my intelligence classes at the Bush School that if you want a successful career in US intelligence in the future, there are three things that you really need to consider developing expertise in. And the first is China, because China is the long-term national security threat to the United States and to several other countries as well. So make certain that you develop knowledge of China. Secondly, money. Financial intelligence is a rapidly developing area. If you can bring down the money flows of a terrorist group, of a foreign intelligence service, of a narcotics trafficking organization, of organized crime, you can destroy it. And we need to do a much better job of that and tracking their money flows. And we're getting better at that. And then of course, the third area is cyber. Cyber is the future. And we're adding courses at the Bush School in cyber because we need to prepare our students for the reality of the threat that we face, but also of the potential that we have offensively to use cyber against our potential adversaries in the future. So those are the three areas. If I could start my career all over again, and I would love to, I would try to get into the CIA's China program. I would learn Mandarin. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. And I would become a China counterintelligence expert because that is where the threat is. And a lot of my students are doing exactly that. Yeah, Mandarin is really, really difficult to learn. It takes <laughs> quite a bit of dedication, I would say, and a quite a bit of time to learn it, especially for you know us, the people that you know don't have any, so to speak, language similarities. 
um, to, 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 to Chinese. I believe like, for example, for me, it would be much easier, I believe, than for an average American to learn Russian because, you know, among other things in Boston, we have Cyrillic. So that takes like 90% of the problems in terms of the letters and the pronunciations and stuff like that. But um, let, let's backtrack, but in terms of China, and this is something that you've written about ex extensively within your book, and we're gonna put it down in the description below so that everybody can read it because it's a really interesting book in terms of intelligence and actually counterintelligence world and the United States, um, United States' um, lack of strength, you could say in regards to it. Why is China such an enormous problem for the United States and for some other countries when it comes to espionage? China is such a significant threat because it is throwing resources into stealing our secrets and our technology at an unprecedented level. The Russians haven't gone away and they are still a very serious concern to all of us in U.S. intelligence. But China is in a class by itself. What they are doing is massive. It's pervasive. They continue to go after the traditional espionage targets of political intelligence and military intelligence. But the number one objective of Chinese intelligence is technology. They want to steal our technology. They have decided that they want to catch up with the West and to do that, they need to enhance their technological capabilities. And their choice to do that is espionage. Espionage for them is a lot faster and a lot cheaper than doing the R&D themselves. So they're coming at us from many, many different directions. They are flooding intelligence assets into the United States. It is something that has got to stop because we are hemorrhaging our technology uh, to the Chinese. Uh, and they're voracious. There is, is no area of research or of technology or industrial process that they are not interested. If it is ahead of where they are, they want it. Even in things that you wouldn't suspect, things like agriculture, things like medicine, just things like industrial processes in many different areas. They are very, very eager to acquire by stealing it from the United States. And not only the United States, but any country that has advanced technologies or is doing cutting edge research in any field will be targeted. If you ask the counterintelligence officials of any Western country, and I talk to my colleagues, in Canada and the UK and Australia and New Zealand, France, Germany, they will tell you exactly the same thing. If you ask them what their number one concern is, what their number one worry is, it's always the same. China, China, China. So um, the, the, the reason why that's happening as far as I'm, as far as I understand is twofold. Um, the first one is the Chinese are putting a lot of resources into espionage precisely because, and I've, I think I've heard about, I've heard you talking about this in one of one of your guests, like one of your interviews is that, you know, that the Chinese, especially in the last couple of, I don't know how many years, haven't developed any piece of military technology that doesn't have an American print within it, an American signature, so to speak, within it. Um, so that's the first reason, you know, all of those resources being put in. I believe the second one would also be, I mean, the manpower, simply, you know, the amount of, you know, available men and women that would carry out the tasks. And the third one would be also, and this is something that you've written about and that you've given advice for, the weak defense of the American system. If I, if I may term it that way. What are the, some of the specific lacks of defense in terms of the American, um, of the United States, that is, you know, defense against Chinese, but also let's say Russian espionage as well. Right. I think we need to have greater awareness in the American public and particularly in the government and in the corporate sector, the financial sectors, that this even exists. A lot of people are very naive 
They don't realize the extent of what's going on. So we need to educate the American people. That's why I wrote to Catch a Spy for one reason, to expose what's going on to the American people. And as you saw in the book, I particularly focus on China, Russia, and Cuba as probably the most uh, dangerous adversaries that we have right now, the most active in coming after our secrets. We need to have better defenses. We need to protect our secrets better. We need to, I think, limit the access that Chinese have to American technology, to American universities, to American companies. We need to be more careful about what people do when they travel to China. The Chinese are trying to lure American companies into cooperative relationships. And that's not bad. It's good international business to a point. But the Chinese impose conditions. And once they have this productive relationship going, they are pulling more and more technology out of the company, including protected technologies, uh, proprietary technologies. Uh, it's very tempting for American companies to ingratiate themselves with this lucrative Chinese partner by sharing technology. Uh, they are in our universities. They are trying to establish relationships that give them access to the research that's being conducted in our universities. Uh, they are sending a lot of students to the United States. <clears throat> that is a significant issue for us in counterintelligence. Um, and of course, the cyber attacks are um, very malicious, uh, very widespread, and they're very good at them. You know, the Chinese have all of these what they call information warfare stations, mostly run by the People's Liberation Army in China, attacking uh, American corporations, American government, the American military. And it is uh, something we've never seen before. Uh, the extent of that and their successes in being able to get into our databases. Um, we need to have much better cyber defenses than we have now. So we need to train our, our young people. There's no reason the United States should not be a leader in cyber defenses. Um, you know, young people, Americans are on computers at the ages of three and four. Uh, but the Chinese also are very, very skilled at uh, at computers, and so they're, they're ahead of us right now. We need to stop that. How does one do that? You know, uh, um, putting aside the strength when it comes to technology and cyber technology itself, you know, putting up better defensive and offensive, of course, structures. But in terms that you, something that you've spoken about um, just earlier on, in terms of like, I believe this is yet, a, no, this is 100% certain that I've heard of you talking about in one of your interviews that there are around 300,000 Chinese students within the United States, like let's say at this point in time. So the issue that comes to my mind is twofold. Um, you have freedom and you have responsibility that need to be levered. How does one carry out the responsibility of protecting one's nation and putting up defensive structures. Whereas on the other, sa on the other side, you, you have to preserve the freedom of those 300,000 students coming in and basically doing what 99% of them are doing, getting education, wanting to start you know, different lives, getting experiences. The one thing that comes to my mind as a potential, um, as a potential solution, but you know, that would in my estimate, in my, you know, so to speak, layman's guess would be to, you know, do more true um, background checks, but to do background checks on 300,000 people is like, it, it, it's kind of sounds unrealistic. It's impossible. How can we possibly do a background check on a Chinese applicant in China? Because China controls any yeah. access we would have to records, to any kind of transcripts. Uh, we have no ability whatsoever to check the backgrounds of uh, people applying for uh, educational opportunities in the United States. And we know that 
uh, some of the people who are sent to the United States as graduate students, particularly in engineering, uh, fields that have military applications, are actually PLA officers who are undeclared. Uh, they send them here without uh, uh, revealing the fact that they are actually active duty military officers posing as students. Uh, so we have to accept the fact that we don't have much capability in in screening these people, uh, giving them access to our best universities, to these high technology fields, I think has a, a downside. In fact, we are training their future military engineers, their researchers in the military related fields. Uh, and I think that that's maybe a little bit short sighted on our part. Uh, giving them that kind of uh, extra advantage because we have to realize the fact that China is an adversary and it is building up a military capability. And we are assisting the buildup of that military capability by training so many of their, their top engineers. Mm, and not just in terms of the military, but also in, tra- in terms of the trade secrets and in terms of, you know, trade in and of itself. I'm not sure what the name is um, of the initiative that the Chinese are putting in Europe. It's one road, one something. I'm not sure of the, of the full name, but it's like the spread of economic power and investments of yes. Chinese, for example, in the neighboring country of Serbia is enormous. Yes. And that's like... You know, it, it has been a while since I was studying international relations and diplomacy in my undergraduate. But, you know, that's some, one of the things that I remember. It's like that's a clear display of immense soft power. And all of those things need to be tracked about. Right. The, the Chinese, of course, are very skilled at insinuating themselves into foreign countries. They do it in terms of different kinds of exchange programs. They do it in terms of investment in the infrastructure of foreign countries. And that is a, a way for them to get inside the country. It is uh, the door inside that country. And then once they're there, once they have a presence, they can continue to build their influence. It's classic. Uh, it's uh, imperialistic, of course. It is uh, spreading their, their, their influence. It is uh, building capabilities overseas that they could use in the future to their advantage. So they definitely have expansionist tendencies and they are reaching out to many different countries. And what they have to offer, particularly in developing countries is technological assistance. And they, they do that uh, very, very aggressively. Mm. But what about Russia? Um, Russia is a second adversary, you could say, in terms of the strength right below right. China. Um, but they are they as, success, as successful or less successful than Chinese, and why? The Chinese are a very formidable adversary, or the Russians. I, I, I meant to say the, Chi- the Russians are a very formidable adversary. Their threat to us is not as great as China's threat simply because of the magnitude of it. Uh, what the Chinese are doing is several times greater than what the Russians are doing. But the Russians haven't gone away. Their intelligence services are very aggressively operating inside the United States. I believe, and some of my active duty colleagues have confirmed this, that the level of Russian espionage in the United States and around the world is higher now than it was during the height of the Cold War. Uh, Vladimir Putin is obsessed with America, and he has been directing collection activities against the United States that are very, very dangerous for us. We cannot underestimate Vladimir Putin. And so we know that he has uh, sent a lot of operatives to the United States. He is involved in a lot of covert action. The Russians are also using cyber to infiltrate American institutions, uh, to undermine the democratic process in the United States. It's insidious what the Russians have been doing. So I tell my students that, uh, all right, if you want to study Russian and become a Russian counterintelligence expert, that's a good investment in your future also because the Russians are are still there. Mm -hmm. And they're good. 
They're they're very very good. They uh, the new SVR and the new FSB are just as skilled, just as good. They're the same people <laughs> as the old KGB. Um, so Russian espionage is a is a reality, um, and Vladimir Putin, of course, comes from that background. He's so he's the spy master in chief yeah. for Russia today. Yeah, he was an an ex KGB officer, I believe. That's the that's he right. Was I remember we were tracking Vladimir Putin when he was still a lieutenant colonel in the KGB in Germany. And we knew we knew already what he was. We knew how ruthless he was. We knew how dangerous he was. What what year was that? I mean, approximately. Oh, uh, that was way back in the uh, 1970s. Ooh. We were tracking Vladimir Putin. Yeah, I mean, it's like. A long, long time of mutual um, intelligence and counterintelligence, and because we are nearing the end of the, you know, time allotted to our conversation, I would like us to talk about counterintelligence itself because it's a really, um, it's a really interesting subject to talk about, but not an, int- not a, it's an interesting thing to talk about, but it's not a thing that one wants to do for too long, as you have said yourself. (laughs) Um, Why is that the case? The world of counterintelligence is very murky. It is trying to frustrate the activities of foreign intelligence services against your country. You are in a world of deception. You are in a world of manipulation. You are in a world of a lot of ambiguity. It can play tricks on your mind. A steady diet of counterintelligence can create some paranoia, some more serious psychoses in some cases. In my book, I point to the example of James Jesus Angleton, who went overboard, in my opinion, who became so obsessed with the Russian threat that he he lost touch with reality. And I think that's dangerous. In fact, in my case, when I was out in Vienna and the cable came in from the director, asked me to go back to take over counterintelligence, my wife Meredith and I went for a walk that night so we could talk openly. And Meredith comes from that world also of intelligence. She knew the reputation of counterintelligence and how it could warp people if they got too engrossed in it. Said, okay, Jim, if you really want to do this counterintelligence job, okay, but don't stay too long. Mm. because she didn't want her husband to go weird on her. I think I'm still okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, Angleton stayed 20 years in counterintelligence work, and that, I believe, is too long because he saw ghosts everywhere. He thought that the Russians were six feet tall. He thought they controlled everything. He really did a disservice to effective counterintelligence by pursuing things that weren't real. Uh, he became a conspiracy fanatic. And that's unhealthy. A good counterintelligence officer maintains a balance of the real world against the threat world. And sometimes those two worlds can become uh, so mixed up that uh, you lose touch with what's, what's real and what isn't. Thank you for the insight. And that makes absolute sense even for a layman like myself. Um, because we're at the end, of the conversation, I would like to ask one final question, and it directly relates to your current position as a professor um, of, of um, practice of actually counterintelligence intelligence and counterintelligence itself. Um, what would your advice be? Because um, I was talking with like a couple of episodes ago, I'm not sure how long it wa- how long it ago it was with an ex-KGB officer, um, ex-KGB agent, and, you know, Jack, Jack Barsky. And, you know, once I asked him in the end whether or not he would do it again, um, he says with the present day knowledge, he wouldn't because of the havoc it wrecked on his life. And whether or not he would actually advise like young people to do it, he says something along the terms of It's not that I wouldn't recommend it, but I would tell them to seriously consider the possible repercussions for their own moral, for their own moral high ground, because some things that you believe in will be swept under the rug because you will have to do certain things for your own country and for somebody else. 
that you don't necessarily agree with and that could b- break havoc on you psychologically. As far as I've understood from you, you know, you would, you know, repeat it all over again. This is something that you truly found yourself in, something that you found the true, true purpose within. What would your advice be to the young aspiring, whether or not CIA or let's say FBI, any sort of like covert operative um, intelligence officer, whether it's a man or a woman, um, what could they do to best arm themselves to be both psychologically sound and to, how would I say, to bring out the best boat for their own country and for their own service? It's a very good question. I certainly would recommend intelligence and counterintelligence and professions for, for young people. I don't care what country you're from. It is a fine and honorable thing to do to defend your country, to protect your country's interests. And one aspect of that, of course, is intelligence and counterintelligence. Intelligence is the first line of defense in ensuring that you are prepared for the threats that your country faces. Counterintelligence is specifically focused on obstructing the efforts of foreign intelligence services to take advantage of you and your citizens, uh, to infiltrate your government, to steal your, your secrets. It is something that requires a great deal of dedication If you don't really feel the patriotic call to serve your country, then you're going to have trouble sustaining that motivation because it is hard work. It's often thankless work because your successes are not known. You are subject to a lot of attacks from people who don't truly understand what it is that you're doing or misinterpret the the techniques that you're using. But it is psychically an extremely rewarding thing to do. You go home at night feeling really good about what you've done. You've done something you care about. I've got nothing against the corporate world. But for me, that never would have been satisfying. I mean, what did I really care about making a couple million dollars more for some multinational corporation? Other people can do that. That's fine. I I respect them. Our country needs them. Our economy needs people in that field. But for me, for whatever reason, it would have been meaningless. I want to serve something I really believe in. And our country is something I really believe in. And I admire patriotism no matter where it is. I have respect for people in our adversary services. You know, a Chinese intelligence officer is dedicating his or her life to to China's interest. A Russian intelligence officer is doing the same thing. Uh, So those people deserve respect because I think service to country is a noble thing, no matter uh, what country you're you're doing it for. And so I I tell my students that uh, as long as they sustain that motivation, as long as they're doing it for the right reasons, and as long as they continue to preserve their honor, their moral code. They will do things they would not ordinarily do because that's the nature of intelligence work. It's based on deception, manipulation. But I believe that you're doing those things for a greater good. And I believe that's morally justifiable. I mean, I lied, I cheated, I stole, I manipulated, I coerced throughout my career. But I have no qualms about that because I believe that doing that in the legitimate defense of our country was morally justified. And the only way to do intelligence work, only way to do intelligence is to use those deceptive techniques. You can't do it otherwise. And where would we be? Where would any country be without intelligence? We would be defenseless. So we're serving a very fine cause by going out and collecting information which is going to protect our people, to keep them safer. And after doing that for many, many years, I have absolutely no reservations in preaching the beauty, the honor of serving our country as intelligence officers to the young men and women that I have the privilege of working with at the Bush School of Texas A&M. They're going out to do important work. 
And when I hear back from them about how excited they are, how happy they are, how fulfilled they are in serving our country as intelligence officers, that's a good day for me. I'm <laughs> really feel good about that. That's why I'm here. That's what uh, I am committing myself in my second career to doing. And George Bush was so proud of what we were doing because that's the reason he set up this school uh, specifically to send our best young men and women into careers of serving our country in, in many different ways, but in his mind, um, specifically including intelligence. I think that's a beautiful message to actually end uh, end our talk with because um, you finding uh, all of that fulfillment and trying to spread the importance of finding the purpose within the intelligence and counterintelligence work is something that I can see purely basically radiates from you and your smile and you know I cannot say thank you for your service because I'm not an American, <laughs> but thank you for the excitement that you share. Thank you for the many insights and thank you very much for the knowledge that you're sharing with your students through your interviews, through your book, and that you share with me right now within this conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was an excellent interview. I really appreciate uh, the fact that you invited me to be on, on your, uh, your podcast. Keep up the good work. Thank you, dear Professor Alls. Bye-bye.